We're continuing our study of prayer, and in particular, we begin to uh, look at the Lord's Prayer, the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. And so our text that we'll read this afternoon is Matthew 6 and verses 1 through 13, but we'll be focusing just on uh, verse 9 and the opening words of the Lord's Prayer. But let's give attention to God's holy word now. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them, for then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret." And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they, seek, uh, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. This is God's holy word. May He bless our hearts this afternoon. And I invite you to turn with me in your uh, forms and prayers book or in the Trinity Psalter hymnal to the Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day 46. Lord's Day 46 of the Heidelberg Catechism, that's page 253 in the forms and prayers book, page 253 or page 894 in the songbook. be confessing together as a church now this afternoon, Lord's Day 46, question and answers 120 and 121. And so let's uh, confess this together. I'll read the questions and let's respond together with the answers. Why has Christ commanded us to address God as our Father? To awaken in us at the very beginning of our prayer what should be basic to our prayer, a childlike reverence and trust that through Christ God has become our Father and will much less refuse to give us what we ask in faith than will our parents refuse us the things of this life. Why the words who is in heaven? These words teach us not to think of God's heavenly majesty in an earthly way and to expect from His almighty power everything needed for body and soul. Amen. Well, brothers and sisters in Christ, when you enter into the presence of someone of great authority, there are rules for how you're supposed to address them. Uh, So if you're speaking to the queen, you are to address her as your majesty and subsequently as ma'am. To formally address the prime minister of Canada, you would If you're writing a letter, you'd write the right honorable Justin Trudeau. Or to address the president of the U.S., you would say, Mr. President. There's proper ways that you're supposed to address those in great authority. Well, how are we to address the only sovereign God of the universe? The one who has authority over all kings and all queens and and all heads of state. Well, we might expect something like, you know, God over all or O Sovereign God. And of course, you can certainly address God in those ways and in other ways that are faithful to God's own self-revelation in His Word. But uh, our Lord teaches us that it is especially good and fitting that we address God as our Father who is in heaven. And what a wonderfully rich and comforting way to address God in prayer. And we, of course, use these very words, we can use these very words when we 
speak to God in prayer. But even more, it's important that we understand the meaning of these words and how they should shape our attitude in prayer. Uh, We can easily gloss over these words and forget what a great privilege and comfort it is to address God as our Father who is in heaven. And so let's meditate on these words this afternoon, and we'll see that in teaching us to pray, our Father who is in heaven, our Lord is teaching us uh, about our our unity in prayer uh, and about our privilege in prayer and about our attitude in prayer. Our unity, our privilege, and our attitude in prayer. Uh, First, he's teaching us about our unity in prayer with others. Uh, Let me ask you, what pronouns do you ordinarily use in prayer? Uh, Do you always use me and my? Or do you always use us and our? Or do you use a little of both, depending on the context? Well, what pronouns does Jesus teach us to use in the Lord's Prayer? Well, He uses our and us throughout this prayer. Now, is that important? Is uh, Jesus trying to teach us something? I mean, He could have taught us to pray, my Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name, and give me this day my daily bread, and forgive me my debts as I forgive my debtors. And lead me not in temptation, but deliver me from all evil. But Jesus didn't use me and my when He taught His disciples to pray here. And we need to ask why. What's He teaching us about prayer? Well, One of the bad habits that we tend to have, not only in prayer, but also in life, is that we tend to be me-centered. We tend to be me-centered. This is due to our selfish sin nature, of course, but it's also the, the focus of our narcissistic uh, North American culture. And, and furthermore, one of the besetting sins of North American evangelical is this kind of rugged individualism. And so all of these factors influence the way that we can tend to pray. We, we can tend to have a me-centered and me-first approach to prayer. We often might begin praying for our own needs and rarely get around to praying for the needs of others. Uh, But Jesus challenges our individualism and our self-centeredness when He teaches us to pray, Our Father. And then the first three petitions, notice, they don't even focus on me or even us, but on God and on His kingdom. He teaches us to pray, Hallowed be Your name, Your kingdom come, and Your will be done. And so He teaches us the importance of God-centered prayer. God first approach in prayer. We were created to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever, and Jesus wants us to grow and mature in that, and to do that in the way we pray, to enjoy glorifying God in prayer. Just as we saw at the Ten Commandments, which begins with love for God and then uh, love for man, secondly, so too the Lord's Prayer begins with God and then moves towards petitions for man. And the petitions are not just for me, but for us. And so think about your prayers. Where is your focus in prayer? Is it the same focus that Jesus teaches us in the Lord's Prayer? It's not to say that you can't pray for your own needs, nor is it wrong to address God with the first person singular, I and me and my. The Psalms often cry out, my God, or save me. Jesus cried out on the cross, my God, my God. But in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus teaches us never to forget that God isn't just my God. He's our Father in heaven. We belong to His church. We are members of Christ's body. We are brothers and sisters in His family, and He wants us to always remember this. And especially when we are praying with other brothers and sisters, it's especially appropriate that we pray with the words our and us. Our Lord wants us to learn to pray as one church family and to never lose sight of the corporate nature of our prayers. You know, I've noticed that sometimes children will speak uh, of their father or mother in the presence of their siblings and say, my dad or my mom. And uh, what are the other siblings thinking? Hey, it's my dad too and it's my mom too. (laughs) It's not just yours, right? Have you ever heard children, especially when they're real little, they, they'll, 
say, you know, my dad said this or my mom said that. And you're like, that's my dad too. Why are you saying it like, acting like it's not mine? You know, it's our dad and our mom. And uh, sometimes uh, people can kind of pray like that. Uh, right? They're in the presence of other people. I mean, how strange would it be if I led us in corporate prayer and I only used me and my and never said our? You guys would just feel the separation, right? That, hey, aren't we one family here? Aren't we all brothers and sisters here? Don't we share one God and Father together? And so, too, when we pray, especially with other brothers and sisters in, in a group setting or uh, in corporate worship like this, it's, we should be praying our Father, who is in heaven, and, and for us, and, a lot, and, and, uh, and remember our unity in prayer in that way. Uh, as Al Mohler put it in his book on the Lord's Prayer, Jesus is reminding us that, we, that when we enter into a relationship with God, we enter into a relationship with His people. When we are saved by Christ, we are saved into His body, the church. And think about the unity we also have, not just with each other here in this place as we worship together, but also with uh, people around the world and throughout church history who pray the Lord's Prayer. Perhaps no other words in the English language have been spoken as much as this, these words. And, and we've been praying this prayer as a church for thousands of years, ever since Jesus taught His people to pray this prayer. And so as we pray the Lord's Prayer, we express our unity in prayer, and Jesus teaches us about that. But it's, uh, it's not merely about, about saying these words, it's about saying them from your heart as one who truly is a child of God. And how do we become a child of God so that we can address God as our Father? Well, that's our next point. Let's think about, secondly, how Jesus teaches us about our privilege in prayer. We know from our earthly families that only uh, one's children, whether biological or adopted, uh, has the privilege to address a, a man as father or dad or daddy. Right? If a boy comes up to me and calls me daddy and I'm not his daddy, I'll gently correct him and remind him of who his daddy is. <laughs> it's not me. Uh, your daddy's over there. Because calling me daddy is a privilege reserved for my own children, and that's true of all parents and their children. And so, too, not everyone in this world can call God their father and address him as such. God is not the father of all, and not everyone is his children. So we should count it a great privilege to call him our father. We've come into a special saving relationship with God as our Father. And how is this possible? Well, when Jesus commanded us to pray in this way, He introduced a completely new way to pray at this point in redemptive history. The Jews were always careful with how they addressed God in their prayers. Uh, some had such reverence for God's holiness that they wouldn't even uh, use His personal name, Yahweh. Uh, and even though they had been a praying people for many years, they had never been commanded to address God personally and directly in prayer like this as our Father. And now certainly the fatherhood of God is an Old Testament concept. We uh, begin to see that this morning. Uh, but in the, the 39 books of the Old Testament, God is only referenced as a father 14 times. That's it, just 14 times. Uh, we, for example, saw this morning that it's used with reverence to Israel, right? God says to Moses, tell the Pharaoh, Israel is my firstborn son and let my son go. Uh, we, and then we hear that again, like in Deuteronomy 32, Moses says, do you thus repay the Lord, you foolish and senseless people? Is not he your father who created you, who made you and established you? Uh, the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah 63 says, for you are our father, Though Abraham does not know us and Israel does not acknowledge us, you, O Lord, are our Father, our Redeemer from of old is your name. And so it's used with reference to Israel in a, just a few places, and it's also used with reference in the Old Testament to the Davidic king, uh, where the concept of God's fatherhood is present too. In 2 Samuel 7, when God enters into that Davidic covenant with King David, He says, uh, 
of David's son, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. So there it is again, this idea of the fatherhood of God. So the concept is there with the nation of Israel and becomes focused on uh, the Davidic king, but compared to the 14 times in the Old Testament, Jesus calls God his father around 60 times in the four gospels alone. And this is especially appropriate for him because think about who he is. He is he's the son of God in every sense of the word. He is one with God. He's the eternally begotten son of God who has eternally been with the father and uh, shares his divine nature. And so he's God the Son, but also He fulfills the role of true Israel. Israel failed to be God's Son who pleased Him, committing idolatry over and over again. God saved Israel, His firstborn son in the Old Testament, that He might serve Him and worship Him. Well, what did they do? They ultimately turned to idols and worshiped the same idols as the pagan nations around them. They were not pleasing to God. And this is really a, a major theme of the whole Bible, this idea of the sonship of God. Who is going to be the son that God is pleased with, the son who is the perfect son, who obeys God perfectly? And so you come to Jesus' baptism, and, and then you hear that, that, that declaration of God the Father, this is my son, my only son, in whom I am well pleased he does my will, right? And Jesus says, it is my food to do my Father's will. It is always my delight to do my Father's will. I, I never do anything of my own accord. I am the one who loves to obey my Father. And He does that perfectly. And God is pleased with Him because He fulfills all righteousness as the uh, Son of God. And He's also the truest Son of God in terms of this messianic con concept of of the Messiah, the great David's greater son that would come along and be a, a son who would build the temple for God and, and sit on David's throne forever and ever. Uh, he is great David's greater son. And so Jesus, above all, has the right and privilege to call God his father as the messianic son of God and the only begotten son of God, even as true Israel, even as our second Adam. I didn't even mention that. But uh, Adam is the son of God, according to Luke 4. He's our second Adam, our final Adam. And so he fulfills this role perfectly in every way. But where does that leave us, then, apart from Christ? Well, apart from Christ and his saving work for us, we're outside the family. God is not our father apart from Jesus. Ephesians 2 says that we were once dead in our sins and trespasses and, and uh, enslaved to the ways of this world, enslaved to the devil, and we were children of wrath, it says, like the rest of mankind. Apart from Christ, that's who we are. We're children of wrath, destined for destruction. And that's because of our original sin in Adam and because of all of our actual sins that we deserve that wrath. And apart from, from Christ, we are, in fact, children of the devil, really. We're in bondage to Him. All who are outside of Christ are of their father, the devil. As Jesus said in John 8 to the Pharisees, if God were your father, you would love me. You are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. Or as John puts it in 1 John 3, whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. So that's the bad news. That's the bad news for all who reject Christ. They are outside of God's family. They are children of wrath, children of the devil. But John goes on to tell us the good news. He says the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. That's the good news. And the good news is that for all who trust in Christ, We've gone. Our status has changed. We're no longer children of the devil, children of wrath, but children of God is our new status. And how is that possible that we have gone from wrath to, to riches, from children of wrath to children of God? Well, it's because God adopts us. He adopts us by grace alone. 
through faith alone and because of Christ alone. And this was His sovereign plan in eternity past. As uh, Paul says in Ephesians 1, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before Him. In love, He predestined us for adoption to Himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of His will. That was God's sovereign, merciful plan for us in eternity past. Think about that, that God loved you in eternity past. And He didn't choose you because of anything good that He saw in you. He simply set His love upon you and said, you are going to be my beloved child. I'm going to set my affection upon you, my mercy upon you, my protection upon you. You're going to be my son. You're going to be, have all the rights of eternal life and the eternal inheritance that my only begotten son has earned and nobody else has earned, but I'm going to give it to you through him. Which is why John 3.16 says, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. He gave us His Son so that all who believe in Jesus are given the right to be called children of God. Children born not of the will of man or of the will of the flesh, but of God, as, for, as John 1 puts it. But you see, our adoption, it's, it's, it's all of grace. It's a free gift for all who believe and trust in Jesus Christ. You can go from wrath to riches. But let us never forget the great cost. This adoption is the most costly adoption that's ever occurred in the history of the world because he purchased us out of slavery and adopted us as his children, not with so silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. And so let us be thankful that we are adopted children of God. We've all become sons of God through faith. We've all received adoption as sons. Now, as, as we listen to that, we've all received adoption as sons. You know, it's over and over again I've said sons, and, and I haven't necessarily mentioned daughters. Uh, the Bible says sons over and over again, and that shouldn't be off-putting for us females here. Um, because as we heard this morning, that was part of their culture back in the day. Uh, daughters didn't receive uh, an inheritance. Uh, only the sons did, which is why it was so important for the women to marry and be taken care of. Now, things are obviously totally different in our day and age, and uh, I assured my daughters last night that they'll get an inheritance. <laughs> and even though Evan, our firstborn, enjoyed the idea of uh, you know, the firstborn getting a double portion, um, I told them, don't count on it. <laughs> Um, but the, the, the thrust of what the Bible's saying here is, look, in the kingdom of heaven, we're equal. Even daughters receive the, the inheritance as well and are called sons. Uh, we are co-heirs, male and female, uh, with Christ and the glories of His kingdom. And uh, not only that, we're, we're not only called God's sons, His, His children, but we receive that eternal inheritance, and God puts His Holy Spirit in our hearts, the spirit of sonship, to assure us that we are indeed children of God, because we struggle with assurance, don't we? Does He really love us? Are we really His children? Are, you know, um, you know uh, maybe I'm just a bad child. Maybe He's going to cast me off. No. The Holy Spirit assures us that we are the children of God. He writes the promises on our hearts. He enables us to believe them, and, and He enables us to cry out, Abba, Father. So that is the instinctual cry of our heart, just like it is of any child in the middle of the night when they're sick or afraid, and they cry out, Daddy or Mommy. The Spirit gives us that instinctual cry as well, and He dwells within us forever. So this and so much more is, is our privilege as the children of God in prayer. When Jesus teaches us to pray, our Father, 
who is in heaven, let's not take that for granted. What an amazing thing it is that we who are once children of wrath can, can pray that and know that God loves us and, and pray that with great cost, the blood of Christ, and pray that as a gift of free grace when we don't deserve it, and pray that knowing that we have the spirit of adoption, and pray that knowing we have an eternal inheritance that awaits us. So Jesus teaches us and wants us to know our great, not only our unity in prayer with others, and remember that when we pray, but also our privilege in prayer to our Father. And from this flows forth then what our attitude in prayer should be, as uh, we see here in our third point, our attitude in prayer. Uh, what sort of attitude should it create in us as we address God as our Father who is in heaven? Well, as our catechism puts it, it awakens in us at the very beginning of our prayer what should be basic to our prayer, namely a childlike reverence and trust. That's a wonderful phrase, a childlike reverence and trust. Think about that as you go to God in prayer. As I address God as my Father, as our Father, we should have a, a childlike reverence and trust as we pray. And think about that, how, how children, uh, they have a, a reverence for their fathers, right? Especially, especially when they're little and dad appears so large and huge and, uh, you know, he's much stronger. He could easily wrestle me to the ground. He could easily, you know, throw me in the pool, across the pool. He could be, uh, you know, easily bounce me super high on the trampoline or whatever, right? He's, he's super strong. If I can't open the peanut butter jar, dad can open this for me, right? And, and he's, you know, he, he provides, he protects, he loves, and, and there's this this reverence that children have for their fathers naturally. And so how much more then should we as children of God Almighty have a childlike reverence? I mean, uh, you know, as we get older, we realize our dads aren't that strong. <laughs> Once we get a little bit older, uh, and they get a little bit older and a little bit weaker, um, but we also see their weaknesses, right? But God has no weaknesses. God is all-sufficient. He's all-powerful. And so how much more ought we to have a, a childlike reverence and respect for God, our holy God, who is in heaven? And so this is why Jesus adds, who is in heaven, he sa- and our catechism says, these words teach us not to think of God's heavenly majesty in an earthly way and to expect from His almighty power everything needed for body and soul. We never need to doubt that He might lack the resources that we need and the power that we need. He's able to give us everything that we need for body and soul. And so when we pray, we remember that our Father is almighty God, the only God, the maker and sustainer of heaven and earth and all that dwells within he sits in the heavens and does all that He pleases, and, and uh, He created the whole world just by speaking it into existence, and He sustains everything at all times. He, he caused the, the virgin to conceive. He raised Jesus from the dead, and now we can know the immeasurable greatness of His power towards us who believe. This is our Father who's in heaven. And so remember that too, children, as you pray to God, that you're praying to Almighty God who is so big and so mighty, and there's nothing that He can't do. And so, just as uh, young children naturally have reverence for their earthly fathers, praying our Father who's in heaven is meant to awaken us a childlike reverence. But it's also meant to awaken in us a childlike trust. Uh, We need not fear His majestic power and glory because He is our Father, for the sake of Christ. He's mighty and He's merciful. Uh, recently, I've been pointing out to our children in the hymn, Holy, 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 that we sing that, right? We sing merciful and mighty in the hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy. And, and it's wonderful to hold those two things together, right? Because if you think about it, if He's mighty but not merciful, well, then it means that He's, he's, he's able 
to answer our prayers, but he's unwilling. He doesn't want to. He's mighty, but he's not, if he's not merciful, then he's not going to show us mercy. But if he's merciful and not mighty, well, then he really wants to, but he can't. But because he's both merciful and mighty, he's both willing and able. And because he's not only the sovereign God in heaven that gives us a childlike reverence, he's our Father in heaven, we also have a childlike like, trust because he's our Father and He's a good Father. He's a, he's a gracious Father. He's a merciful Father. He's a loving and compassionate Father. He's a gentle Father. He's tender. He's kind. And we need to remember that as we pray our Father who's in heaven. And that's so important because some of us may have a hard time relating to our Father in heaven because we had such bad earthly fathers. Maybe we had a father who was absent, who was never around. Or maybe we had a father who was abusive and harsh. And so we have a hard time relating to God as our father. But even those of us who had had good earthly fathers, we still know that they had sins. And uh, when we pray to our Father in heaven, we need to to banish those thoughts that those, those things have nothing to do with our Father in heaven. He's not an abusive God. He's not an absent God. He's a God who's there. He's always there when we need Him. He's, he's there. The Lord is at hand. And so, do not be anxious about anything. But by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, present your request to God. He's, he's there. He's at hand. And, and He's a good and gracious Father. He's patient. He won't ever... He's, he's a loving God. He gave us His only Son. That's how you know for sure that He loves you, is in the cross of Jesus Christ. He gave up His only Son for you and me. And so let us have a, a childlike trust that our Father's a perfect Father and He'll never fail us. And to encourage a childlike trust in our prayers, Jesus says in Luke 11, what father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, we'll give him a scorpion. If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? And as Matthew puts it, give good gifts to those who ask him. Commenting on this, Tim Keller writes, Jesus is saying something wonderful and powerful. If earthly fathers who are sinful ordinarily want to make their children happy, how much more committed is our perfect heavenly Father to our well-being and happiness. That means there has never been a parent on earth who wants joy for his or her children as much as your Father in heaven wants joy for you, his child. There's never been a human father who wanted to answer his child's petitions as much as God wants to answer yours. Yet we know that God is not only loving, but holy and just. How can he shower blessings down on sinful people who deserve the opposite? The answer is that Jesus got the scorpion and the snake so that we could have food at the Father's table. He received the sting and venom of death in our place. Isn't that beautiful? He took the sting of death on the cross. He he fought the devil, the snake, in our place so that we could have food at the Father's table and be His children. And, and thanks be to God, God raised Him from the dead and seated our elder brother at His right hand, and He's our sympathetic high priest. And so we have all the reason, as we begin our, our prayers, to address God as our Father who is in heaven. We have all the reason to pray with a childlike reverence and trust. And so may we do that more and more. May God, by His Spirit, enable us to that. Amen. Let's pray. Dearly Father, we thank You for Your Word and what comfort it is to us. And You are Almighty God and our Heavenly Father, and we love You, and uh, we love You because You first loved us. And help us to always remember that and keep that in the right order. And know that no matter how many times we've failed you and, and sinned against you, 
you always love us and forgive us, and nothing will ever separate us from your love. And, and no matter what sufferings we go through, it's all according to your, your good and fatherly hand. Nothing comes to us by chance, but by your fatherly hand. So help us to, to trust you and to bear patiently under trials and tribulations, and to always be thankful for whatever prosperity we know, and, and, and to also be confident of the future, knowing that it's in the good hands of our Heavenly Father, who is in heaven. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.